Well, hi. Uh, my name is Tom Rebecki, and I'm here in my uh, shop, The Red Barn, in Healdsburg today. And today we have a huge honor. I've got my normal partner in mischief, Bobby Vega, here on the end. And we have Jack Cassidy, the one and only Jack Cassidy, as many people consider Jack the father of the American rock bass scene. Uh, his influence it's more just like about grandfather these days. <laughs> I think we're all in that category to some extent, you know, aren't we? We're all a little long in the tooth here, but uh, what a huge honor it is to have you in the shop and to have you visiting today. And this is, uh, well, first of all, I hope you had a good flight up here. It was uh, comfortable and warm and safe. And Everything was just dandy. It's a pleasure to be here. This is a great environment for me. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of coming full circle, as, I, as uh, Bobby knows, and, and you know that, that I've always dabbled in, a, in this genre of uh, building instruments and, and uh, working with that uh, parameter. And uh, so here I am, I've commissioned Tom here and put the challenge up beforehand to build an instrument for me and for everyone that a bass player can play without uh, amplifying uh, reinforcement. Uh, a, a true bass guitar that will actually have bass-like properties in the room across from, for, for instance, a mandolin or another acoustic guitar. I worked with a guy called Yorma Kalkinen who does a finger-style finger guitar in our group, Hot Tuna. And uh, it's not a loud form of playing. It's not. It's not heavy hitting or any of that uh, kind of thing. It's a very articulate. I, I often say it's like having two hands on a piano instead of one. You know, you, 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 he does bass lines. He does support lines with the thumb. He does melody with the fingers. And we've developed over the the last fifty years of playing together. Fifty years plus. Um, wow. uh, a, a rapport between uh, the function of a bass guitar, which is what I play, because I started out playing guitar and moved to bass guitar, um, and, and uh, the acoustic guitar. But I'm a closet stand-up bass player that doesn't play well, but I love the tone. A lot of my early heroes, Charlie Mingus and Ray Brown and so many other great players from the jazz world and the classical world, of, of the instruments of the double bass and the cello. Those two instruments, the timber and the tone, of, of all, was what pulled me into bass guitar playing in the first place. Uh, so I always have that as part of my makeup. And, and I wanted an instrument that would have enough body and volume uh, but be, be able to play it like a, like a bass guitar, but in a room where it would hold its own where I could be inspired by the instrument, by the tone. Uh, and this is not an instrument to necessarily play a lot of notes on in a very rapid succession. This is an instrument I want for you to play just the opposite, to play very few notes, but have those notes carry enough weight that you don't feel like you've got to fill the time up with another note because your notes just dropped off. So that's the challenge. I, it's the spaces that I want to carry the tone and the note placement. And um, if that is, if, if Tom's able to do that, <laughs> nope. you know, then, uh, <laughs> then I'll have an instrument that I can pick up at home by myself in a room and, and be inspired by the tone of the instrument. That will drive me, as we like to say, that, that will take me down the rabbit hole wherever it's going to take me. So there we go. And, um, and uh, this is the, the first... Uh, gathering uh, to to look at the the beginning construction of uh, this instrument that I commissioned um, uh, in the uh, middle of the the year in 2013 hi there <laughs> <laughs> you know we we, uh, we have tried we are trying with this I thing. know you're out there but you know <laughs> when I'm thinking you know I get this far away look you know Jeez. you know the, the whole uh, purpose of this blog that we're doing here as silly as it is is to be as non-commercial as possible you know we, we one of the reasons why Bobby and I wanted to do this and uh, wanted to do this for years is because we have our own language, we carry on. Bobby's worked so close with me on basses and on guitars and uh, over the years that people say we, we speak our own language. And so to have you here is a huge honor for both of us. I think 
when you showed up with this challenge for me, it was really the kind of thing I love because if you're building one thing, then you have to build the same thing again and again and again. You know, I've always wanted to be on the cutting edge. So Jack's challenge to me, once again, was to build an instrument that would have that kind of response. And uh, in order to make a guitar that wasn't just a guitar, big guitar with four strings on it, making believe it was a bass, and particularly for an artist of Jack's caliber, because he's a deep, deep musician, you know, a conversation with Jack will show you his years of experience. And when he talks to me, I try to pay very close attention to every aspect of what he says. He talked to me about, he actually put my finger on the bass and actually stroked the note as he would stroke it. Very much of a teaching role for me as a guy who's interpreting a lot of different players' work. And uh, one of his points was, the halfling bass, which I built for Bobby, was very much designed for Bobby and uh, to make a dimensional quality of sound out of it. Uh, but uh, Bobby's a different kind of player and, and uh, with a much different kind of approach. And yet you both have a common language. Uh, so for me, I, I would attempted to, to turn this and to make it a much bigger instrument than it really physically can be. I'm working with my halfling type top and we're using a wedge-shaped design to increase the air mass in the lower section of the instrument so that it, when it's on your lap, I can get as much air mass into the instrument as possible. And you can see the interior structure. I've also chosen the shape of this thing based on the success of this guitar, which I originally built. It just happens to be on this calendar, but the shape of it, it's a reverse teardrop. So seeing this as a, as a, as a final rendered shape, I did this because when I was asked to build a teardrop, I thought I'll make a teardrop that puts the base real estate on this side of the soundboard because you need length of the soundboard, not an idiot teardrop on this side, I shouldn't say that, not a teardrop on this side because that was a real design a concept. And oddly enough, this year I have a commission to build a standard teardrop, uh, my teardrop. But this was my way of saying to the industry, this is, there's all this extra real estate here. We can take advantage of this. And since I don't have to interrupt this with a sound hole and a conventional arch top, I can put the sound port up here, and we have really huge length available for bass propagation. The other part of the, uh, and the wedge, uh, which is not my original invention, this was from my great, great dear soul maiden friend, Linda Manzer, who thought of the wedge, and of course, Linda and I are working on the projects together, and you know, I called her and said, can I have permission? She's ma making me do a lot of really unmentionable things, but we're good buddies, and uh, that was what we're doing. But I thought this was the ideal adaption to this, this particular type of instrument. Explain the wedge. Uh, the wedge is an instrument that is shaped so that it's narrower on the top, wedged out on the bottom, because the ergonomics of an instrument, when most of us play a guitar, if you look at most of what we do, we're holding the instrument and we're looking a little bit on the neck. The instrument is typically angled back a little bit. And I studied your videos for your incredible Epiphone bass. Jax has a bass made by Epiphone that he's designed. Uh, which is a uh, semi-hollow style at bass, beautiful instrument. But when you watch, I watched you play that instrument on your videos uh, at Bobby's suggestion, and we could see as the instrument sat here, it sat at a certain angle. Your hands were, and this is the way you seem to naturally play that instrument. So I thought that adapting this to you would be a good choice. The point, the fact that it's a teardrop just gives me more wedge shape in a kind of an artistic way. And because this instrument has been followed by a lot of people, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. You have to have a little art somewhere in all of this. But what drives me most is the sound of the instrument. So Jack's challenge also is can you make an instrument that's acoustically really viable. And I wanted to combine the worlds of the uh, steel string guitar, or the rather the true jazz instrument with the, I think that's our resident frog or a phone ringing. Um, wanted to combine this. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you this is a live blog, and this is why I kind of like this. We're not, we're really not doing this in a, in a superly formal well, way. Feed him. <laughs> Do we have any frog treats? Whose phone is that? It's, a, it's yours. It's mine. Excuse me. <laughs> please <laughs> tell me. Duck. Please tell me that Duck is not your wife. You know what? It, oh, got Buddha Dink too. No. <laughs> Pardon me. I will just kill this. I apologize for that. See ya. Well, for those of you who have mother-in-laws, I always wanted to put Ernie K. Doe's mother-in-law for the ringtone, but you know that's another story. I like the, what's the what's the first line of the first first? Oh God, I've the worst person I know. Mother-in-law. Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> that's just a slight aside.
question. Do we have to get BMI clearance for that or ASCAP clearance or anything? No, probably no. not. I think maybe that's added to that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, the, the idea to have these two incredible maestros at the same table for me is a huge treat. So, you know, pardon me for being a little giddy today. It's a delight, delightful thing post Christmas, day after Christmas. We're enjoying the, you know, the holiday spirit here as well. So it's just really wonderful. I'm honored to have uh, two, two, uh, two guys who patrol that particular part of the underworld so well. But, uh, you know, to, to continue with this, the concept of we've just gotten the top on the instrument. And what I've done is to take what is common in the uh, stand up bass, which is the bass bar which is on the inside, you'll see there's a bridge involving a, this piece, pardon me, Jack, this is a bass bar, uh, but it's also reduxed to have passages cut through it so I can put the much diminished side of the X-brace, which is a standard part of the Vega Rebecca bass, and I call this, you know, the first one of these things was the Vega bass, uh, so I still think of it that way. I would not have built it were it not for listening to Bobby making my ears jump, frankly. Um, and so, like a Boucher brace, this will translate most of the energy right into the, uh, the base side of the soundboard with this elongated grain structure. We leave slightly under here to give us more area underneath the tail block so that that's even viable. This allows the energy to get translated much like an electrical circuit or a wire directly down into the top. And the energy will dissipate uh, because the X brace will let that energy dissipate and translate very quickly to those other parts of the soundboard. So what I'm expecting here is a very large bass, acoustically audible bass, with a complex decay, which will create uh, what I call texture because of the slight differentiation in the soundboard's uh, articulation. It's a halfling soundboard, so the flat side of the soundboard is more bass specific. Carved up section of the top is, and if you orient it that way, you'll see that is more carved like an arch top. So this should give us the best of all worlds. This is like taking a double bass and but still not, and putting it into the same box as the guitar, giving you the ability to have that big textural. The thing that stuck the most in my head when you talked to me, you said, and all your references to Mingus, because uh, Mingus, is, Mingus is extraordinary. You talked about watching him very close up and listening to him. You talked about the way your string, uh, you had me brush the string the same way you do, which is so different than what, what Bobby does. All of that really sunk deeply into my consciousness. And so with this, you know, I'm trying to bring these worlds somewhat together. And I think we'll be able to do it with this instrument because it features deep air mass. It features uh, bass bar. It features, and my original plan was not to use anything but the bass bar and a little bit of an X brace. But as I built it, as with anything, you have to put your hands on it. And you have to experience it and then decide what's really going to work. So it was you know, kind of the way this has come along. Uh, I noticed something here. Yep. Just now. Um, I noticed the, the, the tail block here um, is not touching the top of the, the spruce top. So is that so this can continue resonating? Yes. But it looks like it's going to touch in the back. It touches in the back. So exactly. what I've done is to take that tail block and relieve it to give you more soundboard to right. uh, right. so what's really appropriate. And uh, you asked me a question earlier in, uh, today, which was about the size of that tail block. And, it's for two reasons. One, to mass load the instrument, because mass loading the terminus points of an instrument helps to create less loss of electrical energy, and, uh, or what I consider to be energy in an electrical model. But it also counterweights the instrument, because the practicality of playing a, an instrument with an elongated neck is you want the instrument to balance in your hands. You know, And uh, it seemed like the ideal way to do this. Otherwise, it's a fairly conventional um, structure. What was interesting about this, however, was that in order to make this, I didn't want to just take the top and then create an angle off the top, so I split all of the angles equally, which meant that we bent that material at about nine inches thick. I made a skirt to go around the entire piece of material, and we architected it and laid it out, and I made a pencil line around it. So I took both sides of that wedge, because it's not just two planes like this, it's two planes like this. So the architecture becomes incredibly complex. So I couldn't even figure out how to make this without creating this outside sort of marking device. And then we cut it by hand. That was a day when there were a lot of chips flying and a lot of risks taken. But now that we've figured out how to do this, I now can take those lofted patterns and create the next uh, instrument from it. And um, so the top is Engelman spruce, which is a, a rounder, uh, softer sounding material in the sense of uh, 
more bass specific, less edgy, because I think the instrument will have plenty of bark. Back inside our myrtle, uh, which is bay laurel, which I might have made soup out of. Uh, but it's a fantastic sounding material with a history of bass, you know, specificity, really great. So we're just sort of looking at how it fits in, in, into Jack's hands. To build a big instrument like this, Jack's not six foot three, for God's sake, so I have to work around his physical structure like with anybody who comes to me and try to find a way to make all of these things work together and not become awkward to play. So I hope this works out in that way. That's my... Oh. That's his disclaimer. That's my disclaimer, just in case it doesn't work. <laughs> well, Bobby, you know, when we worked together on the halfling, I mean, how many times did you come over here and sit with me and, and just say some, sometimes you had to say the same thing 10 times for me to really get it. You well, know, you? you had all the recipes, and then when Samandis, when you did the halfling guitar, and you said, I got it, I got it. <laughs> and I went to the, wherever that was, up at the, the Hillsburg Guitar Show at Chateau, whatever that is, the Claire. Rooster, or, yeah. uh, Chateau. Uh, and you hit the low note, and I went, <gasps> and then after that, you, that's when everything really just like came together and, and whoosh, whoosh, lined up, and that was it. Well, yeah. you and I worked an awful lot on instruments together, so you know, you use language like fire right, you know, and uh, another one of our Bobbyisms for the day is to fire right. You know, what does that really mean? Well, we would get a string on an instrument and we would. We would try to get that, that string so that when he picked up the instrument and he played it, <clears throat> there wasn't any thinking about it. It just naturally happens, and that's, Bobby calls that firing right. I adopted that vocabulary, and I expect to go through a similar process here with you, know, with you on this instrument because you have different, different end goals, but you're still both tremendous musicians and very musical. Uh, you impressed me so much with your discussion of the depth of your musical knowledge when we talked. You know, we've all watched you for years as the young upstart bass player, incredible character, tearing it up on stage. And now as, as you've gotten to this point in your life, you're, you have a, a depth of musical understanding that's really quite uh, special. You know, I, I think this is why it's all worth send, not sending us all to the Soylent Green tanks, by the way, because we actually do know a few things now. But, uh, you know, uh, your discussion of that was fantastic. What are you doing these days? You're playing with mostly hot tuna or uh, that your major that's, project? That's my primary uh, uh, musical outlet. Uh, we both do uh, electric, which means you add drums. Go figure that out. <laughs> it's the only ac real acoustic instrument on stage. But anyway, you add drums in your electric, uh, and then you add some, some more wattage. Uh, but, you know, I've... I've always had um, an affinity for chamber music, for small hmm. combinations of music where you hear the character of, of the players and the interaction of, of what you can produce with just a few people. So, uh, uh, Yorma Kalkin and myself, we started playing together in 1958 when I was 14, he was 17. I and mean, that was like the Buddy Holly covers and all that kind of stuff. In a, in a small band, I was playing a, a guitar then. And actually, a lot of the bands, uh, you would have another guitar player, they would just play on the low strings of the, uh, the guitar, and that was the bass, you know. In any case, I started playing bass as well in 1960 when I got my first uh, uh, jazz bass, uh, Fender jazz bass. But um, I enjoyed, I've always enjoyed classical music and being raised in Washington, D.C., I had the wonderful opportunity to, to, to uh, be right in the center of the Appalachian Mountains, the music from the Appalachian Mountains, the, the country music in general, rhythm and blues, jazz, classical music, the folk music revival of the early 60s, and, and all of that going on and just uh, from, from my uh, becoming aware years from when I started playing guitar at, at, uh, at 12 years old uh, in, uh, in 1956. So um, when I was really young, I, I, this is a, a somewhat of a shaggy story here, but um, I had rheumatic fever when I was seven. I was put in this... Uh, Children's Hospital in, in Maryland for a year. My father is a, is a doctor and my uncle's a doctor. And wow. My father's a dentist. And, and they got me in a, in a trial program for penicillin, as it turned out, because it was just being used, uh, applied in, in the civilian world after the Second World War for infection. So they, they tried this on rheumatic fever. And uh, the long, that part of the story, it worked. You know, half of us got the penicillin, half of us didn't, yeah. with, the, with the obvious results. 
And um, but I had to to um, I wasn't allowed to move. In those days, they didn't let you move. You know, I was in bed for six months. You know, so you had to figure out things to do with your mind, and 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 uh, you know, I couldn't go out and play and all that kind of stuff. And music was one of the things that uh, that uh, that I was able to appreciate, and it also would take me out of the realm of the hospital and and all these little kids dying, and and it put me into a world that that uh, was created with my mind and and my senses, uh, and um, and my imagination, and this small combination of players. Whether later on, when I was around 11 years old, started listening to Bix Beiderbecke and all these musicians of the 20s and 30s. Luckily, my father uh, belonged to the American Jazz Society, and he was an audiophile, and and uh, we we listened to records all the time, and I and he he. He'd, uh, at that time, I liked a lot of the big band stuff that was co that was in the early '50s. That was a little too sweet and, and organized for me. I liked the stuff coming out of the, the late '20s um, that had a lot more interaction with with the musicians, and but also I could hear the personality and I could really get excited. And I started listening to Jelly Roll Morton and and wondering about Storyville and New Orleans and all these stories, the Library of Congress recordings. And when I was about 12, I started going down to the Library of Congress. And you check yourself in and check records out, you know, uh, disc out. And you go in little booths and play these, you know. I, it got so bizarre, I was listening to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Alan Smith recordings of uh, 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 the rainforest. And, uh, I mean, Alan Lomax recordings of the rainforest and the Harry Smith collection and all these kinds of things. Uh, today, we have the Internet, which is fabulous for exploring music of all over the world, uh, and people are starting to respond to that and, and, and use influences of all kinds of music. But in any case, when I got a chance to get on the, the number 12 bus and go downtown to, the, to uh, uh, hear various concerts, or various uh, uh, classical music concerts, at Lisner Auditorium, or, or at so many of the great places you could hear in, in, in Washington, D.C., I got to hear these great pieces up close and in person and get to, there wasn't as much sound reinforcement then at all. So you really heard that the singers had to project and the musicians had to project with their instruments. It wasn't, it wasn't pushed up, you know, with a great, you know, Meyer sound system like it is today. So um, I got to, I was, I was just submerged in this world of tone, and it's, it's followed me around my whole world life. World of tone. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that's the seductive nature of any instrument, is the tone. The tone is what draws you in from around the corner. You know, the tone is the thing before you can even discern the melody. It's, it's that seductive nature. Uh, and when a, a musician has great tone, have, has developed their own individual tone, and everyone has their own tone. Their DNA makeup's different, all three of us sitting here. The, the molecules in my fingers are different than Bobby's and different than Tom's here. And when I teach out at the Yorma Calkin and Fur Peace Ranch in <laughs> southeast Ohio, I stress that to my students that everyone has something unique to develop, but you have to learn to start listening for it. But it's followed me around my whole life, tone. And when I had the pleasure of being in front of uh, Youssef Latif and, uh, uh -huh. and uh, Charles Mingus and Eric Dolphy, Eric Dolphy, one of the great, great uh, inspirations of my life, you see him play the bass clarinet in front of you, and he'd be like this far away from me, and you'd hear these, these resonances coming out of the instrument that would just move you to tears. And regardless of the, the, action, the melody or what his approach or what he was doing with the notes and the linear structure of the music, when I heard Charlie Mingus or Ray Brown in front of me or, or Scotty LaFerro or all these people, and, then, and I'm 15 years old or something, I'm hearing that their fingers touch the strings. I get a chair up there in a, in a little club, and I sit in front and listen. And it, interestingly enough, it, it, I didn't have the training, it's a violin, you know. I didn't have that training, but I was a guitar player. But when I moved to bass when I was 16, I started playing bass as well. 
I felt I uh, found myself going up the neck of the bass into the cello range, because some of the great cellists that I'd heard, those resonances would just tear tear me up. Right to the heart. So um, I've been, tried to incorporate all of that in my playing, from using the lowest lows and the simplest of notes to lay down patterns to really perhaps uh, far too many notes than the piece ought to have. And uh, uh, but with that in mind. Uh, as, as you move through different stages of your career, you uh, try to shore up uh, maybe defects in your playing uh, physically or rediscover things you've forgotten already. Uh, at the same time, uh, the tone is, is always what pulls me back. You know, and uh, I tell my students, I say, S sit down and just hit an open A note on the third string of your four string bass. And, and move your fingers over the string until you like the sound. You know, find that sound first, then center yourself, and then start playing. Don't play in front of the TV with, a, with your electric bass not plugged in if you're playing electric bass, you know. It doesn't do any good. You just, you know, you're not listening to what you're actually playing. You know, and, and, and so that's, that's kind of where I, my approach is to the instrument, you know. And that's, that's why I wanted, I've got a, a number of, of acoustic basses at home, a, a Guild B30, you know, I've got a Dave Mays, mm -hmm. which is a lot of fun, I've got a couple others, I've got a huge bass balalaika that <laughs> that uh, I got in Palo Alto, 1967, I think, from a character named Dante Perfumo, I'll never forget. A <laughs> great name. Oh, just fantastic, and he was. Um, in any case, it was three string, like all the, all the balalaika, there's a contrabass and a bass, that's a bass, next one's just the one that's slightly smaller. By the way, while I was in D.C., I got to hear the Kirov Ballet. I love ballet and, and music made for ballet. And I got to hear the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Balalaika Orchestra. You know, there's the Cultural Exchange oh, cool. Program by Kennedy and, 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 and uh, Jacqueline Kennedy and, and Robert Kennedy, I mean, uh, uh, John Kennedy in the beginning of the 60s. Oh, you had these Russian players that were coming over for the first time and we'd send uh, our players over to Russia for the first time. So I got in on all of that, but, but hearing the Balalaika Orchestra, I was revisited by that in 1967 when I saw this big Balalaika sitting there. And he collected all kinds of instruments. And I got this instrument and had Rick Turner um, uh, convert it over and add the high G string because it was EAD and he did a lamination at the top and put in some real tuners because it was peg to peg. You gotta love that. Yes, I yeah, remember you. Yeah. yeah, and uh, and uh, for those you know, peg to peg, that means uh, th that there's no there's no tuning gear in there, so it's very critical, uh, uh, and and um, in, in getting your instrument uh, in tune, and and it really is the mark of the craftsman of that 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 instrument of how well that that all works up there when you're going wood to wood with no no gear ratio to step it down, you know. So in any case, we did that, he did that conversion, and I used it on a number of uh, recordings. I did third week at the Chelsea with Yorma um, when we were with the Jefferson Airplane. And it rec the engineers loved it, it recorded fantastically. But it is a big, huge triangle, and it is pretty unwieldy t to play physically. But I will pick, uh, I'll take that instrument and play it, not to play necessarily everything I want to play on it because it's not a fast instrument. It's made for, for slower progression of notes, but the next like a tree log on it, and, and, but the tone that comes out is just amazing. Um, so this leads me full circle back here and, and from the days of uh, changing electronics and making instruments at Limbic number one and whatnot back here to 2013 with uh, Tom and, and uh, uh, Bobby here uh, talking about um, unfinished business. <laughs> unfinished business. What a, what a great way to put that because it's a little bit yeah. like writing a song and never seeing it through to this final end. It's, it's you know, amazing. Well, I, I've learned a lot because I used to, as a little biscuit, used to go down to Judah Street and w see your bases being made and I didn't even know of you or knew of you, this and that is all. And then got to see concerts and the inspiration between you know like note chords and 
back then I was going to the carousel ballroom, the family dog, Altamont Speedway. Was and so was I. Yeah, you see what I mean? And I was the little biscuit going, hey, check that out. But that was the first I heard. In other words, the difference was a tone, a sound where, like you said, I would hook you and I was like, oh, wait a second, something else is going on here. So through all these years, um, I've learned so much and, and been inspired, and that's what has opened me up, is the, the different, your, your venture. And, you know, the, the you know, stuff. I have to remember back then, we, it, it, that wasn't, it, you know, in, in 66 when, when they, uh, 65 when the Jefferson Airplane was put together, we all just assembled, half of them were folk musicians and, and mm -hmm. blues and they hadn't played electric guitar. I'd played electric bass in, in R&B bands, you know, with full sax sections and Ray Charles covers and all this kind of stuff in the D.C. circuit and the bar scene. But out in that environment, I, I was, I found myself uh, encouraged to to write my own bass uh, 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 for for uh, songs that hadn't been written, so we were putting all the music together. But one of the things that you forget back then is singers were still singing through Bogan sound systems. Oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, there's, they were known as address public address sound systems, where the Warsaw sounds like this coming out of a horn. So as People dropped out of various uh, industries, in the aerospace industry and, and, and uh, uh, electronic industries, uh, and, and, and as people filtered in and out of, uh, uh, you know, the draft and the war zone and whatnot, people came back with various skills. They came into an environment in the San Francisco uh, scene back then that encouraged uh, an individual approach, or if something was too unwieldy, to tear it down and build it back up again. So. My primary concern in the beginning was to get more high fidelity, an old-fashioned word, uh, into the, the bass guitar because there wasn't the sound reinforcement that carried that low end. That's why we started stacking all these amplifiers up on stage, of course, which was even worse for the Bogan sound system. <laughs> and that's when, um, you know, uh, Bogan. Uh, guys like Owsley Stanley, who, who worked on my, and gave me ideas for my first conversion of the... Uh, uh, Guild, uh, Guild uh, uh, Starfire bass. Um, we started talking about uh, things like what Les Paul used to do is converted everything over to low impedance, you know, which gave you a broader spectrum of sound. Uh, uh, you heard more harmonics. It wasn't as loud as high impedance, uh, which is kind of almost like squashing the sound like a compressor does and puts it out more in front of you. But that's what you have an amplifier for, you know. So. Later on, high impedance was used a lot in basses in order to get them hotter, and, and, uh, or in guitars to get them hotter, so you could distort and, and run and overdrive the preamps of your amplifiers. When they moved over, uh, when they used high impedance in a bass, though, I, I believe that a lot of times they, you lost some of the fidelity, some of the spectrum. So the way to make that up was flip it over to low impedance, but then we started putting in uh, electronics in the, in the instrument. Basically, what Ron Wickerson did with Owsley in the beginning was to match what we had in the studio was basically put a strip in a in a in a more compact fashion to to manipulate the tone. So it was all like a big lab, uh, and basically we were just sawing into the instruments. And, 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 and the first one I had was nice, fancy. Owsley did a great carving, and it came in a module out, and and we used a preamp with nine volt battery. It was a very new thing. Uh, but then you could put bandpass filters in it, you could boost the lows, you could do these things and, and create a, a more uh, control over the tone, a more fidelity of the tone. But you always had instruments that had their own unique sound. You had the Fender bass guitar, the Precision, and then the jazz bass that were just fine not messing with them. Although I must admit, my first, the jazz bass that I put together out here in California for Jefferson Airplane. I took the jazz bass and I put a P pickup right, butted it up right by the, the neck uh, and used concentric pots. And, I, and that was my idea. I did that to get more of the P pickup sound up here, but move it all the way up by the neck to get a rounder sound rather than that mm -hmm. mid-rangey sound that, that came at you. Again, my, that drive to get back to a full, more open tone, but at the same time be able to use your Die, your, your finger dynamics to move back over the speaking length of the string if you want to get more mid-range or more articulation back by the bridge. But 
as the years went on and I, and I saw that part of the industry develop into preamps, I realized two things happened. One, you got the sound of a miniature preamp in your bass instead of a nice tube warm preamp driving that. And I like to drive tube preamps. I like, I'm a tube guy. So I like the power part to be tube and I like the preamp to be tube. And there's hybrids and all that stuff developed later. But the, the other thing is that there was a peculiar sound to, uh, 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 to uh, and a rather static atmosphere uh, to those preamps that, that go inside your instrument to, to what then was referred to as solid state. It didn't use a tube. And then I found out all of a sudden, no matter what I tried to do on the instrument, I got the same tone that came out. And then we're back to tone again because I want to be able to control the tone with these things. So um, then after the, the 60s finished, we got in the 70s, we did the Olympic number one. Um, one, of, one of the ideas that I was going over with Rick Turner is we were winding pickups and making different kinds of pickups. Mm -hmm. I said to him, you know, we were building an instrument, which was supposed to be just a hunk of wood and be done in three months. It took a year and a half. And this beautiful thing came out with purple heartwood and, 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 and you know, like and all kinds of scrolling in the neck and everything. And a little stash box back here, I'll tell you. About that <laughs> and, uh, hey, there's uh, the sixes, what yeah, can I say? That was the day. So, uh, uh, I said, he said, where do you want the pickups? And I said, you know, I can't really decide. I said, I, I don't really want three pickups on the instrument. Um, he said, well, why don't I put it on rails and slide it up and down? And it was all supposed to be about the experiment, the moving experiment. And uh, Tom will explain to you in a few minutes how there are certain aspects of this that are going to be tuned and moved around because this is the experiment here. And you should be able to, to not uh, move so far forward to yourself that you're married to the first thing you put together. So. He says, oh, I'll put it on rails. So he put it on rails, and, and, and I remember messing around on stage, much to the <laughs> annoyance of various other band members, and I'd move stuff around and listen to the difference, you know, and then stage in the middle of songs and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and it was a great idea. I, it, it didn't ultimately work, that particular idea, because it, 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 the, the pickup stopped coupling with the body, and I wanted the pickup to couple with the body a little more. Of course, there's different philosophies about that as well. But anyway, go ahead. That's and that's my long, long story on that. But at the end of the day, it's all a big experiment, you know. And we're, and we all want to be enthused about stuff. Um, this and on a personal note, I have to say this because uh, my dear wife Diana, who we were uh, together since uh, 1990, uh, passed away from a long illness of cancer uh, after 13 years of. Of, of battling and trying and going all over the world for all kinds of uh, uh, treatments. Uh, she passed away in September of uh, 2012. So uh, I wanted to, I wanted to build an, I, I thought that was the perfect way because she knew about all my history and building instruments and everything. And she was the greatest listener I ever had in my life. She had my ears half blown out. You know. <laughs> Her ears were in great shape. And when we developed the Epiphone bass, which took about, I don't know, 16 months for us to really get it right. And I was taping different pickup com uh, combinations that J.T. Rivenoff and I made in, in Nashville. And she listened to the tone, and I said, you know, it's just not right. She was the one that said to me, Jack, don't give your okay unless it's right. She's one that, you know, and they, they were getting a little yeah. antsy down at the old uh, Epiphone there, saying, they were. are you ever going to give an okay to any of this stuff? Well, anyway, we found out what was wrong with an, in a manufacturing process, which is a bit of an interesting story, but I'll tell you that another time. In any case, I wanted to, I, I thought about all this, and I thought, what can I do in my life, because it's shattered, and uh, what, what can I do to move forward, what kind, of, what kind of motion can I do that will be healthy and, and 
and be a testament to her, to her courage and her tenacity at, at, um, uh, in her personal circumstances and dealing with what she dealt with and how can I honor her life? And I thought, you know, I, I, I was playing, while I was thinking about this, I was playing the acoustic B30, the guilt B30 in my little den. Uh, and I thought about that, and I started asking various people around, and one of my, my students, uh, 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 I, I asked him, I asked a couple of people about different instruments that are being made out there, and I'd seen a couple come through the ranch. Uh, and uh, one of my students, Greg Franklin, had played, uh, plays a Rebecca bass. Uh, and oh, I know Greg, yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so I called him, I said, I said, uh, uh, because uh, I looked you up on on a little right. investigated, you know. <laughs> I can't hide. Little did I know <laughs> how wacky this guy is. But um, and there was a couple. There's a German a guy, but he start he stopped. And he, I think he passed away, and he made an interesting bass with a port. And uh, actually, the port was in the front, mm -hmm. and came out like like this. And the sound hole was out this. Just you opened up all of this. Well. And um, but and I'd heard. Um, uh, uh, Tom's bass, but not for a long time. Not with the thought process that I had now of putting something more forward in motion. And so we hooked up. Well, Greg gave me the, 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 the uh, I talked to him about it a little bit. Um, and he offered me one of his instruments. And then I went, uh, that sort of spurred me on. And I went ahead and uh, made contact and uh, contact with Bobby and I looked at the videos on YouTube of Bobby with his uh, his instrument. I thought, boy, this is really interesting. And then I made contact with Tom. So, um, so I'm calling this the Diana Bass. Uh, um, and um, one of my friends, um, Deborah Rader, gave me the great idea as she was helping me deal with the person, some of the personal issues. She's a wife of a, one of the doctors, Dr. Bill Rader, treated her, um, treated Diana. She said she found a lock of hair of Diana's that we had in a little box. And I remember a few years ago, we, had, we cut that off. She had long hair, and she, she cut it off for a bunch of chemo treatments. And uh, it was actually told me later on she's so thankful to cut her hair off because it was so hard to, to deal with. Anyway, Deborah said, why don't you have some of the lock of hair put in, in, in the instrument, somewhere inside the instrument. And I began to think about this, and I realized that I, that this instrument would go ahead and live on with, with Diana's DNA in the instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd be hitting a string, and it would be part of the instrument. And I thought, well, this is something that not only keeps your memory alive, but actually she is part of that, because we, we're all told we dust to dust, and uh, we all become particles again. But I'd never had it laid out to me so blatantly before um, in front of me. And so I came up and, and uh, stocked my car up full of uh, my Jeep Grand Cherokee in, in Los Angeles and piled all the instruments I had in it and, and an amplifier that I like, uh, um, uh, 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 George Alessandro point-to-point -point little 30-watt amplifier with a speaker cabinet that I had that I designed with, uh, with uh, uh, Dave Brunschoft at Aguilar. And that's my acoustic setup and came up with everything else I could pile in there and, and, <laughs> and spent a day up here with Tom, uh, set everything up and plucked different things and played around and, and got the process uh, going. I didn't know whether he was going to go for it or, or how it would develop. And I, I, let, I told him all these stories and, uh, and then let him chew on it for a while. And I didn't hear anything for a while. I thought, okay, you know, and then I got this ream of stuff back from him, you know, uh, and the process was was up and running, and spent time with Bobby playing his two instruments that he had, one with a uh, one with tailpiece uh, uh, anchor and one with a with a with an independent anchor. Pinbridge, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, and and he heard Bobby play and and listened to his story about how he uh, got into ve development. A little scared by the seven-year thing, but you know, uh, 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 I thought, well, gee, I'm already about to turn seventy. I don't know. Can we can we put a fire under this guy? And uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, apparently I did. Whew. Thank goodness. <laughs> That's a good well, thing. 
you know, from my perspective, Jack Cassidy shows up in your shop and asks you to do something. It's a huge honor to begin with because of, of what he's had to do with the history of, you know, why we all do what we do here. He's just one of one of the uh, characters in our business. That what I really appreciate is the fact that after all these years of doing this, you are still attempting to push the envelope of development, you know, ahead by participating in this in a true sense. You know, like, like artists call me and they say, make me an instrument, I make them an instrument. Uh, but you know, to actually invest in paying it forward to create and leave another instrument on the planet that has some uh, some weight to it is huge. And uh, I, you know, it's it's you know, people think that I, I don't want them to participate because they figure they're in my space. But the truth of the matter is, I've been doing this for so long. When somebody comes to me and says, you know, I have this specific goal, it's hugely f fun for me. You know, I, I really enjoy the interaction. I enjoy having my intellect fired by a new challenge because, like I said before, this is 90% um, making sausage and about 10% what people think it is. You know, it's a lot of worrying carbide and things flying and dangerous operations. But 10% uh, of what you think it is, or, as we listen to classical music, bending sides. I was telling Jack I like to bend sides still by hand because I love the feel of that to keep my roots here. But any anything that relates to building an acoustic instrument that really does chase that model not the digital model, to me, is still where the rubber really meets the road. Because, as just as music is where the rubber meets the road between mathematical and aesthetic, this is a huge opportunity for me. You know, I've had the pleasure of, of having Bobby not only here, but as a great friend, and, and as really my brother for years now. Um, it was a huge bonding experience for us, and a very intimate act to build that instrument together. No, and, and it's just, it's opened up another, it's really given me a, a huge gift, which is more important than his friendship and his, and his companionship in my life. Uh, Hillsburg would not be the same for me without Bobby here. And, you know, for having you invest in this energy here, you know, I thank you for that because it, that isn't something that comes lightly. I also understand that it's your, uh, it's an homage to Diana. And I, I you know, that is another level, uh, to practice this art on, a, on that level is why I call this a practice and not a business. You know, because if I get to work with folks to, I like to think these instruments have the effect of crea creating some kind of healing wave in the world. If I can do that with anything, and, and if, if we do that going down this road, it's, it's a huge and special honor for me. You know, and so I'm, I'm really excited about the challenge and the ability to actually have you interact with it is really a joy because um, you've done this your whole life, you know. Apparently, as a as a basis, I'm, I'm, I'm overqualified for for work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I'm stuck with this. Yeah, aren't we all? You know, and um, you know, it's uh, the great thing is working with with people of uh, who have had you know you have forty or fifty years on the planet to practice a particular art. You do know something, you know, and uh, people should pay attention because there's an awful lot of depth there that goes. You know, we get together now with my my older guitar making buddies. We don't talk about guitar making, we talk about everything but guitar making. But ultimately mm -hmm. underneath all of it is the, is the pursuit, you know, why would you, which is why we started this idiotic show here, it's because the concept is creativity. What, why do we create? What fires us to create? What made the cave people do those paleolithic drawings? You know, what is that, I'm pursuing in my life the inner aspect of creativity, the inner mounting flame, as I think uh, Mahavishnu once said. Well, you know, all of this is related to this, and you know, to me, this is a, this is why I call this place a cathedral for the work that I do. It's not a shop. It's not a manufacturing place, and I can't call this a business. It's a practice, you know. And so, thanks for the opportunity to do this on this level to both of you, and and and, and particularly for you, Jack, now because you you made this trip and and uh, invested in this. It's not about money, and it's not about you know any of that stuff. It's about tone. So now we have, Bobby's teaching me the lesson about musicality to get me back on track years ago. I never look at anything that's not musical now. And this is about, now the word tone is going to be stuck in my head because of the way you talked about it today. And I know this stuff, but having somebody else point at something and show you something changes the way you look at things. This is, I think, why society is so necessary. <laughs> why it empowers us, you know. I, I, it's just an extraordinary opportunity. So, you know, thanks for your your patience and for your energy investment here. And for you, it's the same thing. I can't make you another thing that looks like a base. You know, we have to take this opportunity to, to leave something better on the planet. You know, and that, that is why I'm here, you know, in, in addition to the few other things. Uh, but this charges my life every day. So this is a great, great opportunity. And I thank you, really. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Well, thank you all. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Later. Back home.